This is a recording from a Sunday meeting of the BC Humanist Association in Vancouver. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect those of the BCHA or its board of directors. To learn more about humanism and to support our work, visit bchumanist.ca and make sure to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and be sure to subscribe to the BC Humanist Podcast. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, this book that uh, came out earlier this year. It's called What Love Is and What It Could Be. Um, I'm going to tell you sort of the very quick version of what's in it, so you don't need to bother to read the whole thing. Get very excited. Um, and then I'm also going to talk to you a little bit about some new work that I'm doing that kind of takes off from the work in the book and pushes that in new directions. Um, and this new work that I'm trying to do is going to be connecting love with um, happiness. So that's my kind of um, latest project. Certainly. Sorry about that. I do tend to talk quite quickly. Um, if I'm doing that, just give me a, a wave um, and I'll try to slow down. Thanks. Um, so the book is, um, just to say a little bit about its background and where it comes from, um, I'm working on a project at the University of British Columbia where I'm a philosophy professor um, and it's called the Metaphysics of Love Project. It is funded by the Social Sciences Humanities Research Council of Canada and uh, the Canada Research Chair which is a, uh, a government funded program. My work is looking at romantic love particularly. So there are many, many kinds of love. All of them, I think, are very interesting, very important. Um, I single out romantic love not because it's the only one that matters. In fact, quite the opposite. I think um, it's one among many kinds that matter. Um, but I think it raises some particularly interesting and um, pressing philosophical questions. So um, my book, What Love Is and What It Could Be, is really asking what romantic love is and what it could be. Yeah. Um, so before I launch into more about what it says in the book, I want to start by addressing um, a reaction that some of you might be having at the back of your minds right now. It's something I get a lot. Um, so this is it. You don't look like a philosopher. I promise I'm going to make this relevant to the topic of the book as well. So um, I, as I say, I get this reaction a lot. Um, so one day I did a Google image search to see if it was true. Um, and it turns out that it is true. At least um, I do not look like the stereotype of a philosopher. The stereotype of a philosopher is a man. He's a white man. He's beardy. And he's probably doing this most of the time right? in his spare time. Um, what I'm trying to illustrate here is that philosophy is still a heavily male gendered discipline. We still think of it, a lot of us, as by default something that men do, something that male geniuses do. Um, and I think this is not unrelated to the fact that, oops, sorry, um, to the fact that it is often associated more with the mind than with the heart. So more with thinking than with emotion, more with reason and rationality than with something like romantic love. Um, and this is why I think as I've moved through my philosophical career, um, my work on the philosophy of mathematics has always been accepted and considered to be standard, core, normal philosophy, uh, whereas my new work on the philosophy of love is considered to be radical, peripheral, and in some quarters even um, scandalous. And if that um, worries you, here's a good chance for you to escape right now before I get into why. Um, but in fact, if you were to go back and read Plato, you would find that the philosophy of love, including erotic love and desire and passion, it's actually central to his work. Um, and so in many ways, what I am doing now is a return to the traditions that my type of philosophy comes out of, despite the fact that we've sort of lost our way and gotten too much, I think, in our heads at the expense of everything else, which is not to say that when we start to think about love, we should set rationality aside. I'm a huge fan of rationality, of reason and reasonableness. Um, but I actually think that the dichotomy, the binary 
um, that divides rationality from emotion, that divides our minds from our hearts, or men from women, or love from reason, is a false one um, in lots and lots of ways. These things are not competitors. They can work together. And actually, um, I tend to think that in a healthy mind, reason and rationality and love will be pulling us together and not apart. So that's sort of a little bit about where I'm coming from. Um, when I'm thinking about love, um, one of the reasons I think it may have gotten sidelined from mainstream analytic philosophy, which is the kind that is very concerned with rationality and reasons, um, has to do with this fact that that kind of philosophy has come to be seen more and more as a, um, sorry, has continued to be seen as a male gender discipline, and love has come to be seen more and more as a feminized thing, something that is women's business, right? If you go to a romantic comedy, that's likely to be a chick flick. If you go read romance novels, they are marketed to women, and they're normally um, written by women as well. And this idea that um, the romantic, and particularly romantic love, belongs with the feminized home sphere, the private sphere, as opposed to the rational, masculine, let's say, political sphere, or the, uh, the sphere outside the home. Um, that, I think, is part of why the philosophy of love has been sidelined, has been seen as something that's not central to the discipline, as I think it is. Um, one of the ways that this, I think, interestingly connects love, the philosophy of love, to the philosophy of gender is that both femininity and love, romantic love, have been mystified, have been made out to be super mysterious things. Um, and one of the ways I've tried to explain this um, in my book and elsewhere is by coining this phrase, the romantic mystique. So now those of you who remember your 1960s feminism will remember Betty Friedan and the feminine mystique, right? The feminine mystique says women or femininity are uh, mysterious. You can't really understand what they are. Um, they're very close to nature, though, and that's very magical and wonderful and spiritual that you can't understand what they are and have things like good medical care and all that sort of thing. So don't try to understand femininity, womanhood. Um, just let it happen, roll with it passively, accept it, um, accept the feminine nature as nurturing and maternal and all of those things and nothing else, um, and then everything will go well. And if you try to critique it or challenge it, um, you're doomed to failure because you know, biology will take over, and that's all very natural and unchangeable. Un, un okay, so that's the feminine mystique. Betty Friedan had lots of things to say about it, and so did a lot of other people. Now, this is, this, the romantic mystique is my label for a very similar package of ideas applied to romantic love. It's magical, it's mysterious, it's mystical, it's spiritual. You can't really understand it. You certainly shouldn't be doing research on it. Um, you can't really change it or critique it or challenge it, none of that stuff. Um, so for me as a philosopher who was trained to critique and challenge and question everything, um, that was a very weird and troubling bundle of ideas. The romantic mystique bothered me, bothers me, as much as the feminine mystique bothered those um, earlier feminists. And I think you know, that the work of challenging the feminine mystique is still in progress as well. Part of the problem is that the mystique enables any problems, any issues, with the current status quo to go unchallenged, because we're not even taught to look for them, to understand them. Um, and so I think of it as just this kind of shrug emoticon, the shrug reaction. So, well, love, love, well, whatever that is, that's great, right? Um, it's a disempowering ideology. Um, it promotes ignorance. It promotes the shutting down of research that could tell us more about what the nature of love or what the nature of women is, are lost track of the grammar of that sentence. It promotes acquiescence in the status quo, and because of that, it benefits whoever is benefiting from the status quo, right? It's in the interests of whoever is benefited from the current ways that we think about, and I would say construct romantic love, not to think too hard about it, not to look too hard about it, because if we do, we might decide to change something. So my work is all about dismantling 
the romantic mystique. Um, I'm not a fan, basically. Um, and so the way that I try so far, the ways that I've been trying to go about that, and these are changing over time, but this is what's represented in the book and in the project so far, um, has to do with looking at this um, uh, question that's sort of a version of the is it nature or nurture question. Um, do we love romantically the way we do, um, if we do, um, because of biology or because we're constructing something socially, because we're sort of being socially programmed to think of love a certain way or to make it a certain way? Um, and so this question sort of hits the road when you watch something like, I don't know if any of you have seen Helen Fisher's TED Talks, where she goes into um, the biology of love, and she talks about the role of serotonin, um, things like dopamine, oxytocin, um, so brain chemistry, right? And she talks about its evolutionary history. Why would we have a brain that responds in those ways when we meet someone who's important in certain ways to us? Um, and so she talks about this sort of the idea that uh, um, way, way back in humans' evolutionary past, we were um, on, um, um, in, in a situation where we needed to form pair bonds, um, opposite sex pair bonds, uh, monogamously in order to raise children through uh, infancy, the first few years of infancy. Um, and that, she says, is the scientific evolutionary explanation of why romantic love evolved in our species. Uh, I have lots of questions about that, but I'm just going to set those aside for a second and move on to the other half of this uh, picture, which is the view, which if you stop listening to biologists for a second and anthropologists and start reading um, humanists and um, uh, literary scholars, that romantic love is something that was invented a few hundred years ago um, in the literature and art of dominant European cultures. Okay, so it's not something that's natural, that's evolved in us. It's something that we made up because it made for good stories and we like to tell those stories and then we like to try to live out those stories. Um, and so we get this sort of, um, again, binary division between the biological view of what love is and where it's come from and the social construct view of what, what love is and where it's come from. And I'm not a fan of these binary divisions and wherever possible, I like the answer that says both and rather than either or. Um, now, I do, have, I do have lots of questions about the specifics of Helen Fisher's evolutionary biological story of what romantic love is, but her work, her research, she actually puts people in fMRI scanners, shows them pictures of, of their loved ones, and watches what their brains do. And it's hard to argue that something is going on there, right? Whatever you think about the exact evolutionary backstory that she then, I think, backfills, um, there's something real going on, right? Brains do something. When, we're, when we fall in love, we're the same kind of thing that we are the rest of the time. We're naturally evolved human animals. We do have an evolutionary history. Um, so I don't want to ditch everything in the biological story, although I disagree with some of Fisher's details, but, but there is so much of how I've been, I think, conditioned and trained to think about romantic love that goes way beyond what you can see in the brain scans, right? There is nothing coming out of those brain scans that is going to help me explain, for example, why I struggled in monogamous relationships for most of my life until somebody introduced me to the idea that it was possible to be in ethically non-monogamous relationships, polyamorous relationships, as they're sometimes called. Um, and now that I am in such relationships, I am very um, comfortable and happy with that um, but a lot of people will still tell me that's not love if you have two partners instead of one. That's, that doesn't count anymore. It's not, you're not in love. If you were in love, it could only be with one person. And when people say things like that, I'm like, you are no longer on this half of the chart here. You are now in this half of the chart. That is part of the socially constructed rule set for how to do love. So, okay, so I think there are both things going on here. Um, and so the tricky thing is how do you ac accommodate both, right? I want to have a dual nature theory of romantic love that can make sense of the biological reactions and responses that are happening in brains and also accommodate the fact that there are these constraints that come from social choices about how to treat each other. Um, okay, and so um, 
this guy here is one of my favorite just illustrations of how I think about these two things. Um, <laughs> so he is, um, he is uh, William Shatner, um, and he's Captain Kirk. Right. So you're looking at this picture, you're looking at Shatner, you're looking at this picture, you're also looking at Kirk. He's an actor playing a role, right? There's nothing weird about the fact that, he, that you are looking at both. That's just, once you understand the relationship between the two, perfectly obvious, right? I think love is like that, right? Once you understand the relationship between the biology and the social construct, the social rules, it's just like an actor playing a role. So we've got the stuff in our heads, it goes off, whatever it does, it has the evolutionary background that it has, but then, we hand it a script, and the script says one person at a time. And until very recently, the script used to say one person at a time of the opposite gender to you. Right? Um, and it also says things like, and probably aim at marriage or something like a marriage, settle down, whatever that means, right? Kids, all this kind of stuff. It's built into the social scripting um, that we hand to our biological actor, whatever's going on inside our brains and our bodies, and then expect it to play. We expect it to be a good casting decision. So um, I think most of the interesting philosophical questions arise once you appreciate that. They kick in around the question of whether that's a good casting decision or not. Right. So the question really isn't nature or nurture. The answer is both. And then the real questions are, so then what? What next? Um, is this a good casting decision? And for whom is it good? Who is it benefiting? that we have written the scripts that we have. Um, when I talk about the script, I'm talking about the sort of normative expectations that we set up of what love will look like. We set them up by creating um, stories, representations, images, culture, art. Um, and these create role models um, or models of what love looks like. Um, and, you know, Google Images, again, is, is a very useful way to find out what that sort of thing is. It all looks for a very, very similar. <laughs> um, you get these, you know, two people, probably opposite sex, lots of kissing involved, right? Uh, lots of kissing, lots of kissing. Um, and uh, something about sunsets, I don't know, maybe you're supposed to, like, go off into the sunset, some sort of happy ever after. Um, this is all part of the script that we're writing. Um, these are our representations or models. And when we lay, keep laying these representations over one another, we eventually create what I call a composite image. So you know when you put lots and lots of pictures over one another, um, and if all of the people in the pictures have like the same chin shape, then that chin will emerge really clearly in the composite image. Um, but if they all have different hair, you just get a fuzzy mess at the top of the picture. So I think when we keep seeing, when we keep seeing pictures of what romantic love looks like, there are certain things that are like the chin that keep coming through as strong contours in the emerging composite image, like two people, like kissing, like, you know, something about the long term, heading off into the sunset together. Um, these things are, are um, part of what I think of as the script that we're writing by overlaying all of these, um, these different representations that have these features in common. Okay, so that's our composite image. It creates these normative expectations. Um, and once we have normative expectations of each other, what we love to do is police them, right? We like to tell people who are not conforming to those expectations, oh, you're doing it wrong. You're doing love wrong. Um, so there are two deep core social norms that, um, that this policing tends to pick up on very strongly. Um, and I think both of these are still... Um, prevalent um, right now. Um, the first one um, is what I use this label here for, amato-normativity. Amato-normativity comes from the Latin word amare, to love, and norm um, comes from the, the words for um, a rule or a line, actually, a, um, a sort of a ruler, effectively. Um, the idea was the idea behind amato-normativity, which incidentally um, was coined by another philosopher, not me, I didn't make this word up. Um, it was coined by Elizabeth Brake. Um, and the idea behind it is that it says, being in romantic love is 
the best thing that a life can look like, right? That's the goal for everybody. It's normal and it's desirable for everybody to be in a romantic love relationship, right? I agree. Um, so amato normativity um, is one of the deep core social norms. Um, another one, which is the one that I've run up against, is uh, mononormativity, and that's the norm that says just one person. You're meant to be in love with one person. Um, in some ways, it's been prevalent to think of this as forever, right? One true love for your entire life. Um, now I think this norm is softening a little bit to allow for serial monogamy to be normalized. So one love at a time, and then we move on to the next one but still one at a time. Okay, so we have amatonormativity and mononormativity, and what they tend to do is they form like the kind of gutters in a bowling alley, and they keep us all like rolling down the same direction towards the same pins at the end, which is something like a nuclear family structure, right? So the mononorm says one person at a time, and the, uh, so not too many, um, but amato normativity says, oh, but you need to have at least one, so not two for you, right? So you've got to have exactly one partner. And once you've got exactly one partner, you form the couple unit, you now become the nucleus for the nuclear family. And the formation and the protection of the nuclear family structure as a way of structuring our society is, I think, at the heart of this part of the normative role of the social construction of romantic love. Um, but it's... These things are so deeply embedded that we hardly ever notice them. We hardly ever think about them. The fact that, you know, the fact that we use phrases like the one to describe what a romantic partner is like. Um, the one. Um, that's, that's, that's partly uh, an expression of mononormativity. And the idea that everyone's looking for the one in the first place is partly an expression of a matonormativity. But these things kind of become like the wallpaper. They're so ubiquitous that we don't notice them until attention is drawn to them, which can happen if, for example, we're breaking the rule, right? <laughs> so I notice mononormativity all the time because I'm breaking that rule. Um, people who prefer to be single, who desire to be single, um, will notice all the amatonormativity around when, for example, their friends or family members keep putting pressure on them to settle down, to pair up, right, couple up. So you notice them very easily when you break them, but if you conform, you probably won't really notice them. You're just rolling down the middle of the bowling alley, right? You don't need to hit into the gutters. But they're there, right? They're there whether or not we notice them. Um, so in my work, um, one of the things that my book is doing that is, um, that is somewhat non-standard for contemporary philosophical text um, is that it, it acknowledges in a way that a lot of philosophers will not um, that the philosophy that we do is also personal. The philosophical is personal is one of my slogans I like to use for this. Um, the fact is that anyone philosophizing about love comes with their own bundle of experiences. Um, that is bound to influence what they think the nature of love is. So I can't set aside the fact that I am not a monogamous person um, and then pretend that I am wholly objective about the question of whether monogamy is really a natural part of romantic love or not. I'm not objective about that. But neither is a monogamous person objective about that. Everybody has bias. It's just my bias is not the standard one, so people tend to notice it more. Um, so my book is not just uh, philosophy written from an abstract third-person perspective. It's philosophy written from my own personal perspective and my own personal life is in the book, it's in the work. It couldn't not be. The question is only whether I acknowledge that it's there or pretend that it's uh, the man behind the curtain, you know, like a lot of philosophers will do. Um, so it's in there. Um, and because of this, I think, the book, um, when it came out, which was earlier this year, January, February this year, got a lot of um, press attention that was partly focused on, on me and my life. Um, and here um, is a picture that was taken for the cover of the Chronicle of Higher Education Review. Um, this is me right here. Um, this behind me here is my husband, Jonathan. And here, this is my boyfriend, Ray. Um, so we are um, we're posing for this picture. And this goes with a, nice, a very nice, very generous profile of me and my work. Um, this journalist has written. She's a friend now. 
um, but I got to know her through this process. Um, so I was, I was really excited about this. I was like, this is great. Um, and then the cover came out, and the headline on the front of it, which the, the journalist didn't write, by the way. You know, journalists hardly ever write the headlines. The headlines are copy written by somebody in-house at the, at the magazine or the paper. Headline, I don't know if you can read this here, can Carrie Jenkins make polyamory respectable? So, you know, no pressure or anything. But can, <laughs> can you, Carrie Jenkins, personally, because it's not respectable now, you know that, right? You know it's not respectable now. Can you just make it respectable? Um, so this was a moment when, um, you know, I, I had a lot of soul searching around this moment. Um, it wasn't just uh, the Chronicle. So another thing that happened was um, ABC Nightline, which I don't know if they have like an equivalent in Canada. It's like a, a late night news program in the US. Um, ABC Nightline sent a crew up to Vancouver um, and they shadowed me around for a weekend um, to make a little segment about me and my life and my work. Um, and the, uh, when they were narrating the introduction to this segment, they said, uh, you know, you might think polyamory is just all these kind of like wacky left coast US liberal hippies, um, but look at these buttoned down Canadians. They do it as well, look, oh, look, buttoned down. Um, and so, I was, I was looking at all this, oh my goodness, what's happening here? Is that, is that the struggle? Am I trying to make polyamory respectable? And why on earth does, does, does me doing this, does me saying I am a polyamorous person um, trigger that reaction? Um, and I think that the answer is, again, stereotyping. People have a stereotype in their mind of what someone who has decided to do this radical and experimental kind of thing with their life would look like, and it doesn't look like, again, it doesn't look like me. It doesn't look like someone who wears a nice blazer and a smart pair of pants and goes and gives talks as a philosophy professor. Um, and so, you know, that, that again, I think, is part of um, this sort of interplay of how our social constructs are policed and the ways that we normatively constrain people. So I get put into a rebel box because I, I'm in two relationships. Um, I don't belong in the rabble box. I, I'm, you know, if you anyone knows Harry Potter, you know Hermione Granger, like the really like <laughs> dedicated, hardworking kid. That's me. I got all the way through, really good at school. I was never in trouble. Um, very hardworking, all the really good grades. I'm just, you know, basically a dork. Um, but something about um, how I love people um, makes me a rebel. And that, I think, is this, um, this social construct in action telling me, you know, you've stepped outside of a line here. Okay. Um, so, okay, if you're, if you're scandalized or anything like that, and, and if you're thinking no self-respecting philosopher would ever argue for such a deviant thing um, as this, oh, that's, uh, that's the, uh, the ABC night line, eh? so that you can use button down Canadian. Let me introduce you to this guy. Sorry, I'll, I'll remove that label for just one second. This is Bertrand Russell. Um, so Bertrand Russell is a huge influence on my work, my life. Um, he's the founder of the analytic tradition of philosophy um, that, that I was trained in at Cambridge. Um, at Cambridge, we read his work on logic and mathematics and the mind and language and all of these other male gendered topics. But he also wrote books about feminism and about gender and about love and about marriage and politics and morality and all these sorts of things. And um, one of his um, most famous controversial scandalous books um, was published in 1929. It's called Marriage and morals. And in it, he defends love that is not monogamous. Um, he defends what in those days used to go by the name um, free love. And what he seems to mean by that is something like, I think, what would now be called a monogamish relationship. Um, so he's envisaging, um, he's envisaging, and he was practicing a kind of relationship where he was married to, um, to his second wife, Dora, um, and they both had openly had other partners, um, and they were fine with that. They were comfortable with that. Um, so that was, and he said, he said, you know, basically he tried to construct the case that everybody's marriage should be like that, um, which uh, I think is committing another kind of error of overprojection. Um, but my point is, he was doing this in 1929 when um, 
nothing like Dan Savage was a cultural phenomenon at all. Um, but Bertrand Russell kind of got to do this sort of thing because he was a member of the British aristocracy, right? He, was he had two of his grandfathers in the House of Lords. He was protected by extreme social advantage, privilege that, you know, we can't even compare most people's lives to, to what he was enjoying. And still, he paid the price for doing this, right? So in 1940, um, he was appointed to a, a teaching position in, in the US at the uh, City College of New York. Um, there was a big public outcry. Social conservatives were up in arms, protests. And um, his job was eventually denied. Um, and there was a legal ruling that he was morally unfit. That's where the label comes from. Morally unfit to teach at the college. Um, so you know, I. I didn't know any of this stuff when I was an undergraduate or a grad student learning about all the other wonderful things that Bertrand Russell had done in the philosophy of mathematics, which I'm also very interested in. Um, but this stuff was kind of sanitized out of his history. We, never, we were never told this stuff. So when I found and read Marriage and Morals, I, it was like bootleg Russell. I was, oh my god, this is stuff's really intoxicating and kind of dodgy. And I, oh my god, what's he doing here? Um, but he was being a philosopher and a human being, right? The same way that I want to be a philosopher and a human being. Here's another person of great interest to me in this connection. Um, this is Simone de Beauvoir. Um, she, uh, she was in a long-term open relationship with Jean-Paul Sartre, as is well known. Um, she's the author of The Second Sex, a bit later than, than Russell, so this is 1949. Um, it's a hugely important book for, uh, well, for feminism generally, but for my work in particular, because one of the things she's doing is bringing out this idea of um, gender as a social construct. Right? She doesn't use that phrasing exactly, but her phrase is one is not born but rather becomes a woman. And she's trying to argue that lots of the ways that we understand what womanhood or femininity are, are created, are constructed by how we treat people and are not just biologically uh, determined or in the nature of women. Um, both Russell and de Beauvoir were hugely successful in circulating ideas to wide general audiences that were both philosophical and radical for their times. They had an impact on the world. Um, in this sense, they are among my inspirations. Right? Um, I should add at this point, though, um, that when I say inspiration, I don't mean hero. Um, I actually don't have any heroes. And the <laughs> reason why is because if you ever try to have a philosophical hero, you'll immediately learn something immensely troubling about them and be devastated. Um, so <laughs> both Russell and de Beauvoir did things that I consider to be morally awful, as well as the cool stuff that they did. Um, you know, uh, so uh, there's, um, I mean, uh, de Beauvoir, for example, um, was, um, was uh, seducing underage uh, women um, into relationships with, with herself and Sartre. Um, and so, you know, I don't think everything that these people did was great or that they are moral saints or anything like that, but I think that they are extremely interesting human beings. And philosophers. And they were both in open relationships and they were both talking about that sort of thing. Um, de Beauvoir makes a suggestion in The Second Sex that I've kind of picked up and run with in, in a way that's been very important for my work, um, which is that, that love is related to gender in very deep ways. Um, and in fact, and she doesn't put it this way, but I kind of read between the lines, I see her as trying to get at this idea that when we are socially constructing gender, we are, among other things, socially constructing the gender roles for romantic love, right? Those two things are not wholly separable. And uh, one of the things she says, I love this, my favorite quote of hers, on the day when it will be possible for a woman to love not in her weakness, but in strength, not to abase herself, but to assert herself, on that day, in the future, she hopes, love will become for her as for man a source of life and not of mortal danger. She actually thought contemporary love, as she saw it, was a source of mortal danger for women. It's still the case that domestic violence and even lethal violence um, uh, is disproportionately directed towards women in relationships. Um, one of the most likely people to kill you if you're a woman is your male partner or your male spouse. Still, not 
in De Beauvoir's day, although also in De Beauvoir's day. Okay, um, so I want to talk a little bit now about some new directions that I've been trying to take my research since the publication of this book and since all this stuff has been starting to happen, um, you know, basically all the feedback, all the information that I've gleaned about the world from watching people respond to what I did in the first book, um, which has been fascinating. But one of the things that's happened um, as that um, feedback, and I, and I use that term in, in some cases in a very loose sense, um, that feedback coming in has, has had some negative effects on me personally. Um, so, you know, when I go um, and talk openly about being a polyamorous woman, having two romantic partners at the same time, um, I get called, you can imagine the names that I get called, right? Um, there is a long list of very colorful words for that kind of woman, right? And I, I have been called all of them. Um, and, you know, I get um, hate email a lot, and I get comments on things like YouTube videos that tell me I have to go choke myself and, you know, that I'm a... Um, a piece of trash and this is you know this is a very common thing for women in, in public life especially women with ideas who are doing life wrong you know we get we get a lot of this um, but one of the impacts of it has been um, sadness depression right it makes me um, struggle with continuing to do the work that I do so one of the things that I've been wondering about as this process happens is what are um, the connections between love and happiness and emotional contentment. Um, because I love what I do um, and I feel very sad about what happens when I do it. Right? There's something going on there. That process is of value to me. It's meaningful to me, but it's not nice. Nothing nice about <laughs> being in the public eye in this way. And this is actually, this goes even deeper than the trolling. I'm actually an introvert and I'm quite naturally. Uh, I'm not a natural performer. I, it takes a lot of work for me to stand up here and kind of, you know, um, um, perform and, and make myself vulnerable in these ways. Um, and I do it because I see the value of it, right? I see changes happening in the world, like that, um, the cover of that, uh, of that chronicle um, issue. But it's not nice. And so um, one of the things that I'm starting to notice more and more is that over time, um, this association between love, um, and not just romantic love now, but all kinds, um, and happiness um, has been kind of jumping out at me from every direction, right? Um, and, you know, for a depressed person who still considers herself to be in love, I'm wondering, what does this mean, right? How can I be, it's, it's supposed to make you happy, I'm sad, but I'm still in love. So what's going on there? Um, one of the ways that it's been jumping out at me is that I've been doing some uh, empirical studies um, with some collaborators. Um, uh, a couple of them are philosophers, and um, one is a social scientist who knows how to do the, you know, the empirical side of this sort of research. Um, and we've been um, trying to get people to respond in open-ended, free-form, prose ways to questions like, what do you think you use to tell when someone else is in love? Or what is love like for you? How do you experience it? And just try and get people to give us their own impressions about that. Um, what do we look for in other people? Do we look for the same signs of love in someone else that we would look for in ourselves? Um, actually, our very early uh, analysis of the data that we're getting suggests maybe not. Um, so that's fascinating. Um, so one of the things that keeps coming up is um, you can see it in their eyes. Right? Third personally, I can see in their eyes if someone is in love. Um, this, I think, is really, um, and, and of course, nobody says about themselves, oh, I have to go in the mirror and, and see whether my eyes look like the eyes of something. No, that's not, <laughs> no. Everyone's so, first personal access doesn't involve the eyes, but s somehow when we're looking for it in other people, something about the eyes. Um, so I'm trying to see how the, um, the impact of what other people think love is in oneself mm -hmm. is related to the social construction, to the policing mechanisms, to the ways that we encourage certain kinds of love and discourage others. Um, and this fact that there's some sort of disparity potentially between what we think love is like in the first person case and when we're looking third personally at someone else, that is really extremely interesting to me because it shows, it points towards the ways in which it might be possible to break out of those third personally imposed social constraints. Maybe, maybe. 
Um, this is all very early stage, so. Um, one of, the, one of the other questions that I'm wondering about is whether this might actually go the other way. It might be easier to say when someone else is in love because you can see things that they're doing um, that you might not even notice in yourself, in your own behavior. Um, so all of these new directions are sort of opening themselves up and I want to explore them with this dual nature view in the background. Love is both biological and social. Um, I think... I'm going to have to, at some point, engage with the fact that almost all of the questions revealed happiness or smiliness to be at or near the top of the list of symptoms. Um, so, OK, so let me introduce that a little bit further. Actually, first of all, let me introduce you to my co-authors, because these are some, some very important people in this work. Um, this here is Nick Fitz, formerly BBC, Natalia Washington, Chapman Waters um, in the US. Um, and they are um, collaborating with me in this research, which I should emphasize also is not published yet. So this is work in progress, and the, the final analyses are not yet available. Um, so what we looked at was we got 108 participants. Um, in the, oh, they're all based in the US, but all around the US. And they were providing free-form um, free prose answers. And then we coded their answers looking for particular themes or topics or words that sort of kept showing up. So um, ha if, somebody, if somebody mentioned smiley, that would get coded for happiness or smileyness. If somebody mentioned forever, that would be coded for permanence, yeah, that sort of thing. Um, here's a, a chart of some of the reactions that we got to just this very, very general question, what is love? Um, so uh, happiness made it into this sort of middling position here. It's not at the top, but it's in there. Um, one of the interesting things that keeps happening here is what I call the Hadaway effect, where um, people say, baby, don't hurt me, every time you say, what is love? Um, and this is just an occupational hazard that love researchers have to deal with. Um, so, you know, um, yeah, sorry for everyone who's going to have that song in their, their head for the rest of the day now. Apologies about that. Um, but when we asked, what is love like, that's when happiness took over. So that's the big bar over here, right? Happiness is appearing in about a quarter of people's responses. And warmth is the second most popular coding there for 15% uh, of the answers mentioning warmth. Um, then we've got excitement, relaxation. Um, this bar here that's labeled universal quantifier um, means, means that, some, that, that uh, the person mentions something like all or every. Um, so it encompasses everything, or it's all inclusive, or it means everything to me. People who are using phrases like that, that's what that bar represents. Um, in case anyone thought things were getting easier here because we have fewer bars, this here is the MISC bar. So uh, <laughs> no, it hasn't gotten easier. Um, it's just we've sort of simplified a little bit more. Um, here we've got trust, completeness, emotional connection, and down here, a little bar for life and death. Um, so, I mean, what I really notice here is just how much bigger happiness is than any of these other themes. Um, happiness is huge in these conceptions of what love is like, what it's like to experience love. Um, so here's the other question we asked. How do you know when someone else is in love? Um, and here... The answers are a little bit more spread out, but look at that first bar again. And now it's gone to over, over 25%, right? Nearly 30. Happy smiley. Um, the other things that you see here, though, are the eyes um, and talking about someone. So the idea that you can tell if someone's in love because they talk about them all the time. That's, um, that's one of the things that I think is a very interesting third personal symptom, right? You might not notice yourself doing it so much if you're talking about someone all the time, but your friends might have noticed that you're doing it. Um, so, okay, so this happiness uh, feature, it's dominating both this question, how do you know when someone else is in love, and that question about um, uh, what love is like. And so, so I'm wondering, you know, what is this? What is this happy ever after business? The philosophy of happiness um, has provided me with some little starting points, and I'm just starting to explore this right now. Um, but one of the starting points, and I think this is going to be really important, is the distinction between two sort of notions of happiness, two broad conceptions of what it means to be happy, um, and some bits of jargon that sometimes get floated around here are eudaimonic and hedonic. So 
the eudaimonic uh, is just well-being, something about your life going well. So you might have a sort of feeling of contentment or you might have a, a feeling of um, satisfaction with your life. Um, but the hedonic conception is this sort of buzzy pleasure thing, right? So you're actually like, yes, I feel really positive today. Everything's going nicely and, you know, I feel good. Um, you could actually feel bad and think your life is going well, right? So that's the difference between those two different notions of happiness. One is more about a nice feeling and one is whether your life is going well, right? Um, so um, what about sad love? How is that going to fit into this picture? Um, and what is this whole business of the pursuit of happiness anyway? Is happiness what we fall in love for? Is happiness what we do anything for? I'm not sure. Like when I think about the project, coming back to the project of doing this book, um, and how sad it's made me, um, because I've seen how people react to, to my being out there in the world and saying these things. Maybe I thought, we, I thought the world had gotten a bit further than it has, to be honest. I was a little surprised um, and, you know, disappointed. Um, and then the election happened last November after I sent this manuscript off to the publisher. And I was like, yes, we actually were flying backwards. This is, this is bad. Things are much worse than I thought. Um, but um, I, I think... Happiness wasn't really why I was doing any of this stuff in the first place, right? And I think happiness was also not why I fell in love. Um, and so when people kept saying in these reactions, in these responses to what love is like, they kept mentioning happiness and smileyness, it puzzled me, right? Why, why think happiness is what it's all about anyway? Um, the other piece of uh, philosophical background that I'm going to try in my new work to incorporate here um, is this idea. It comes out of a... a um, Henry Sidgwick, who was a, a, an ethicist um, in uh, a little bit earlier than, than Bertram Russell. Um, and he, uh, he said in the method of ethics that um, hedonism, um, which is a, you know, a, a form of happiness, right? the pleasure happiness, nice feelings, um, is paradoxical in the sense that if you go straight for it, you can't get it that way. right? If you aim at the nice feelings of happiness, that's you're going to be thwarted because that's not the way to actually make yourself feel those happy feelings. The way to feel happy is to do something you find meaningful, right? And then hopefully <laughs> the happiness and the satisfaction follow from that as a byproduct of meaningful activity. Um, so what that suggests to me is a connection between happiness and something else that Simone de Beauvoir thought was really important, namely agency. She often used the word authenticity for this. So she's an existentialist philosopher, and she thinks that um, the most important thing in having a good life, an authentic life, is having one in which you are making your decisions freely, um, exercising your free will, um, and um, becoming a full human being, not somebody's other. This is the word she often uses for women, and particularly in relationships with men. They become the other, not a full subject, not a full self. Um, so if people like Sidgwick and um, many others are right, that happiness is sort of a byproduct of doing something that's meaningful to you, exercising your authentic agency, your authentic self, um, then perhaps the way to think about love could look like this as well, right? The, the, you don't aim for those blissful love feelings, but you have a love relationship that's meaningful, and perhaps that brings those blissful feelings in its wake as a byproduct, right? Maybe that's a possibility. I'm also influenced here by, I don't know if any of you heard, of, heard the phrase job crafting? Come across this concept? One or two nods? Okay, I'll explain it. So this is the idea that um, satisfaction in a career, in a job, doesn't come just from the external conditions of what the job is, right? It comes partly from how the person doing it sees the job and whether they are able to make the job what they want it to be. Um, and one of the, um, so the, the sort of classic study of this in, in 2001, um, one of the core cases that I always think of when I'm trying to under understand and explain this phenomenon was people who worked in hospitals um, as maintenance workers, right? Janitors and cleaners and so on. Um, and some of them were happy with their jobs, and some of them were miserable. And the ones that were happy saw themselves as part of the healing 
process and they saw their work as helping to make people better and they would they would go into their work and they would do things like uh, moving the pictures around in a waiting room because they thought that the patients who are waiting there would feel better and would heal faster if the pictures looked nicer and so they they took control of that situation they, they exercised agency to make the job what they wanted it to be um, and the people who were miserable were much more likely to think of their job as just you have to turn up and do what you're told which is mop the floors or whatever and they weren't seeing it as something they could craft and make their own and make what they wanted it to be. Um, and so again, what I see, the big lesson I see in that kind of research is that happiness, feeling contented, um, and perhaps also this sort of more eudaimonic notion of happiness, having a good life, having well-being, um, has a lot to do with having agency, right? being able to do life the way you want to do life. And I think this points even deeper into worries about how we know our own hearts and our own minds. Um, so um, the other part of uh, no, uh, happiness research that's not done by philosophers, but um, by uh, psychologists and other scientists, um, is this really troubling um, self-report-based studying of how happy people are. Um, the reason I say it's really troubling to base research on how happy people report themselves as being is that that's only one way of measuring, right? So if you look from the outside, you might see something different than what the person reports themselves, right? We saw that potentially in the love studies, I think. Um, and with the, in the case of happiness, this, is, um, this has actually been studied already. Um, so there is this um, two, uh, 2015 study called uh, Conservatives Report But Liberals Display Greater Happiness, which is fascinating to me in this connection. So what happened was, um, it's, uh, this, and this is older research, conservatives were found to have higher rates of happiness when you asked them how happy are you? Um, but if you used other measures like um, uh, how much positive vocabulary people were using and how many smiles they were showing, um, then the liberals came out happier. And this is fascinating to me, partly because it shows up these potential differences between what we see in other people and what we report about ourselves. Um, and, you know, it doesn't tell you who's right, right? It doesn't tell you <laughs> which kind of uh, measure is the correct measure. It just tells you there is something deep and important about the difference between looking at yourself and looking at other people. Um, and in fact, in this particular study, um, the gap between liberals and conservatives in self-reported happiness could be accounted for by a style of reporting called self-enhancing by these social psychologists and this is a phenomenon that was already known to exist quite generally. Conservatives would display more self-enhancing styles of self-reporting in general. Um, and that actually accounted entirely for that difference in self-reported happiness. So, you know, um, we have to be careful, is all I'm saying. When we go read the science, right, the science, you quite often see these headlines that say, science has discovered that, and then some really exciting uh, uh, finishing to that uh, sentence, conclusion to that sentence. Um, that's usually false, right? Science is not one thing, and science does not say one thing, um, but there's a lot of very interesting stuff at the next level down beneath that, right? Science is actually pointing us in a lot of very intriguing directions. Um, and as philosophers, I think the best thing we can do is try to take all of that on board and then process it, digest it, right? What do we do with that information? We don't just, uh, we don't just accept it, right? We don't just say, yeah, well, everything's sort of biologically determined and therefore um, we just let love happen and it will play out the way that it was meant to as a matter of evolutionary fact. Um, if we do that, we are... Um, at risk, right? We're, we're le leaving ourselves open to whatever gets imposed on us from the outside. It will benefit those who benefit from the status quo and not others. In our participant group in this uh, most recent study, um, we found that men were more likely than women to mention biology in answering the question, what is love? Um, so they were more likely to talk about things like brain chemistry um, or evolution um, or you know, those sorts of natural biological urges than women were. Women, on the other hand, were more likely than the men to agree that love is a free choice, that's something we have agency over, something we have a certain amount of control over. 
This was fascinating to me, um, partly because it links back to my initial worries about the romantic mystique as a disempowering ideology, right, that encourages us to acquiesce, not to take action, not to challenge, not to critique, but to accept things as just determined the way they are, natural. And it links back to my thoughts about who is served by the romantic mystique and my thoughts about those gender roles that are built into our conceptions of what romance looks like, right? Who is supposed to pursue whom? Who has the agency and the control? Who is supposed to be passively courted or have the door held for them, right? That's a question, right? We know the answer in gender terms to who is supposed to go into which of those roles. And so in a sense, um, what this is suggesting to me is that women may be more likely to be aware of the importance of agency in love and not seeing it as biologically controlled because the romantic mystique does not benefit women the way that it benefits men. It doesn't preserve the status quo that benefits women the way that it preserves the status quo that benefits men. Um, and this all goes, this is also, um, I won't go into too much detail about this because I know we're short on time now, um, but there are uh, deep, deep connections between, as I see it, the romantic mystique, romantic ideology in general, and monogamy and patriarchy and the historical oppression and possession of women. All right, and the final link back to here, of course, is to this idea of love as passive, linking it back to that thought that it's, it's kind of somehow it's women's business, and it's not really the business of philosophers who are rational men and thinkers, not feelers. Okay, um, so I think if I've tied everything together now, as I am hoping I will, in the, uh, the next book, which I'm, is currently in proposal phrase, um, uh, I am trying to get at an idea of agential love, and I want to use the actual phrase love crafting to an, as the analog of job crafting. Um, the idea here being um, that if you are able to love um, and to live the way that you want to, the way that you have chosen, and the way that is valuable to you and has meaning for you, um, happiness and those happy love uh, feelings may come as a byproduct of that, right? Not necessarily. Um, the happy ever after that we're sort of taught and programmed to aim for and to use as a signal of when things are going well, but rather the things that will hopefully and eventually appear if in fact we are able to choose to do what we want for ourselves without being policed and without being put back into boxes where we don't fit and don't belong and are being made miserable. Um, okay, uh, so I'm going to have to uh, wrap up there. Um, thank you all very much for, for coming out and listening. I think we have about a, a half hour, 25 minutes now for, for questions. Um, if you want to learn more about me and my work, um, you can find me on the usual um, social media sites, and my website is carriejenkins.net. Okay, um, thank you very much. Thank you,